Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the last week. Our leading story, Intel qualifying 10 nanometer CPUs. That's actually a big one. Ryzen 3 and the 3200G allegedly delitted and shown. Shadowhammer, the Asus involved malware, hammering at least uh, six more victims of note. And 50th anniversary AMD product announcements continue, along with several other news items. Before that, this video is brought to you by MSI's RTX 2070 Gaming Z 8GB card. The RTX 2070 Gaming Z uses MSI's dual fan design with large blades, which we've previously tested to have among the best noise normalized thermal results in the class. MSI's 2070 Gaming Z has a fat heatsink, furthering the focus on reduced noise levels by allowing the fans to spin slower. RGB LEDs naturally are abundant on the card, but can be blacked out to match the carbon and blackout shroud. Learn more at the link in the description below. Quick GN note first, this shirt, the one I'm wearing, has been restocked on the store. Not, not literally this one, it's gross. I've been working all day. But uh, the Blueprint shirt is back on store.gamersnexus.net. If you've wanted one, we have finally restocked them. Thank you for your patience. You can pick them up there and they'll ship immediately. Intel qualifying 10 nanometer CPU. So Intel has acknowledged that its 10 nanometer process is going through qualification. It did this in its earnings call that was just held uh, as of filming yesterday. And it indicates that the year-end release for Ice Lake U CPUs should actually be realized. These 10 nanometer chips will land in portable devices like notebooks and debut the long awaited launch of 10 nanometer products by Intel. Technically, there's been one kind of on the market, but no one talks about it. Intel anticipates sale and shipment of 10 nanometer CPUs for notebooks in third quarter of 2019 with market availability for consumers, that'd be us, in fourth quarter of 2019. So in theory, just in time for the important holiday uh, consumerism season. We previously spoke about Sunny Cove with David Cantor, the expert analyst who has joined us several times. And if you'd like to see uh, what Sunny Cove kind of is at the top level, it was present. Well, it wasn't that top. It was an architecture discussion. At the level it was presented to us in around December of last year. We do have that video on the channel. Of course, we'll link it up there somewhere. And this will. Uh, feature Intel's more powerful IGP, critically. It will also have in-silicon mitigations for Spectre and Meltdown, so that's another important point, and power consumption improvements along with process changes in general. So all of that uh, is coming to the 10 nanometer parts that are finally getting qualified and presumably shipping. It's just that it's not the desktop part that all of us wanted in the enthusiast space. That will presumably follow the notebook part, though, so we'll keep an eye out for that. On all of this, Intel CEO Bob Swan stated the following in an earnings call. On the 10 nanometer process technology front, our teams executed well in quarter one and our velocity is increasing. We remain on track to have volume client systems on shelves for the holiday selling season. And over the past four months, the organization drove a nearly 2x improvement in the rate at which 10 nanometer products move through our factories. So there's your update on Intel 10 nanometer I just really want it to come to desktop at some point so we have something new to play with. But uh, Ryzen 3, or at, well, Ryzen 3000 series will be coming out soon. So we'll get something there. And the Ryzen 3 3200G DLID shows solder TIM or a, a solder interface and more overclocking headroom in theory. So this was done on Chip Hell and a couple of other sites in the West picked it up, like Tom's Hardware. And AMD News is the company's forthcoming 3000 series APUs. The report via Chip Hell shows that a prominent forum member has managed to delid a Ryzen 3 3200G. The delid process was evidently pretty surprising, as the user purportedly found the Ryzen 3 3200G APU now uses solder TIM between the die and the IHS. After dissecting both the 3200G and last generation's 2200G, the user noted die sizes are the same, as is the core count and cache allotment. What appears to be different, aside from a soldered IHS, is the alleged overclocking prowess of the new chips. We actually did delid the 2200 and the 2400G previously. In fact, we did an additional test on it and ran an IHS that was just copper with no nickel plating. It was from Rocket Cool. Ran some thermal tests with that. So and liquid metal, by the way. So there were improvements there, it's just they're such low power parts, they've not needed solder. And the thermal paste is just fine, but we're not going to complain about the addition of solder if it improves the product. So according to the user's overclocking tests, and keeping in mind this product 
doesn't officially exist yet. The Ryzen 3 3200G and Ryzen 5 3400G uh, allegedly yielded 300 megahertz and 320 megahertz overclocks, respectively, at the stock 1.38 volts, or at least the stock 1.38 volts that was running on that motherboard. What's more, the chips didn't run any hotter than their 2000 series counterparts, hitting 76 degrees Celsius at full load, but we have no idea what their testing conditions were. We don't know how well they controlled the environment, things like that. So uh, that number is of limited usefulness because temperature is not a 3D Mark score. But uh, it's promising, or at least makes logical sense anyway, given what we know. So it's hard to draw any meaningful conclusions here from such a small sample size, but AMD's refined silicon and optimized Zen Plus or Zen 2 architectures the uh, 3000 series APUs are rumored presently to use both, uh, should certainly yield some headroom. So no word on when the chips are supposed to launch, but Computex is around the corner, and he is hosting a keynote there, and that would probably make sense as a launch time. It's as good a place as any to make an announcement. Moving on, Shadowhammer hitting at least six more victims. Uh, as it turns out, Asus was not the only company affected by Operation Shadowhammer, as the Kaspersky security team uh, found in one of our previous news videos, we talked about this. The Asus software was vulnerable to this attack. It's since been patched. It's mostly for notebooks. But uh, ever since this, security researchers have come across multiple malware samples leveraging both similar algorithms and legitimate digital certificates akin to the Asus attack. All told, there are six additional companies that appear to have been attacked in a similar fashion to Asus. Of those six, researchers only divulged three. Electronics Extreme, Innovative Extremist, that's kind of a rough name, and Zepetto. The other three companies compromised but not yet identified are, quote, another video game company, quote, a conglomerate holding company, and a pharmaceutical company, all in South Korea. And presumably these have a wider reach and might be getting uh, some private contact before it's publicly disclosed for sake of securing the issue before it can be exploited. In the case of the video game companies that were disclosed, that'd be Electronics Extreme and Zepetto, hackers are able to inject malicious code and payloads aimed at infecting systems, and then the Trojanized games can begin gathering information like usernames, IP addresses, MAC addresses, computer settings, operating system information, and whatever else they have access to. Shadowhammer and Shadowpad are becoming a very high-profile supply chain attack, and it may not be over yet. Researchers noted that, quote, how many more companies are compromised out there is not known. What is known is that Shadowpad succeeded in backdooring developer tools and, one way or another, injected malicious code into digitally signed binaries, subverting trust in this powerful defense mechanism. So far, the count is at seven. Last week, we reported on AMD's special edition Ryzen 7 2700X processor to be unveiled for its 50th anniversary coming up, along with some partner launches like Sapphire's card and Gigabyte's motherboard for the 50th edition uh, or 50th anniversary launches. And while the chip is all but officially confirmed, new leaks suggest that there may not be any special binning or cherry picking that would lead to higher frequencies or overclocking. And if that's true, I sincerely hope that the rumors are not true, then we won't have a whole lot of reason to buy one. But hopefully, hopefully there's some special bending or overclocking headroom because we'd really like to get our, our Ryzen systems to work doing some overclocking live streams. But either way, there is something special. The Dr. Lisa Sue will autograph them. Uh, or at least it'll be laser etched into the IHS for whatever that's worth, in addition to a black and gold commemorative packaging. So hopefully there's more to it than that. But that said, it's possible AMD may still have a surprise left to announce for this upcoming 50th anniversary. And uh, the Ryzen 7 2700X presumably will be made publicly known on April 29th. The next one, in Laptop Mag's annual tech support showdown, the site gauges the tech support offerings of top laptop vendors by posing as average consumers via phone, live chat, and social media. They then compile the results and assign each company a score. For 2019, Laptop Mag finds that Apple continues its streak at the top, followed closely by Razer. Razer's second place spot is notable, as it was ranked second to worst last year. So Razer's improving here. MSI, on the other hand, uh, found, finds itself now 
in last place, a place it was familiar with on these charts, according to Laptop Mag previously. MSI most recently showed its customer support ineptitude by way of a customer support agent informing a customer incorrectly on the 300 series and its support for upcoming Ryzen CPUs, which you are all likely familiar from our last week's news episode. Microsoft changing the tune on the Intel CPU shortage. If you recall previously in one of our hardware news episodes, Microsoft had an uh, earnings call where it stated that shortages in the CPU market, although it did not name its partner that it was accusing, it was Intel, uh, were hurting Windows 10 adoption. And now Microsoft has sort of changed this. The company stated, quote, we feel good about the supply in the commercial segment and the premium consumer segment, which is where the vast majority of our revenue is in OEM. And so I think in those segments, we feel fine for quarter four. This is from Microsoft CFO Amy Hood. Microsoft's recent earnings in some part have been uh, supported by consumers who are migrating to newer editions of Windows, probably finally off of seven, or new machines with recent Windows versions. Microsoft is ending support for Windows 7, it's ending uh, SQL Server 2008 support, and that's a trend that uh, Microsoft expects to continue into quarter four as well for growth of adoption. And Microsoft could also be less concerned about Intel as more OEMs and consumers alike turn to AMD. It's doubtful that Microsoft has any special interest in which CPUs are in Windows machines, so long as they're Windows machines. Samsung announced a 12-year plan to invest $115 billion in both its Samsung LSI and Samsung Foundry businesses. The plan will see Samsung inject roughly $9.51 billion per year through 2030 into its businesses. The $63.4 billion investment will be into R&D in South Korea, while another $52.1 billion will be spent on facilities, expansion, and infrastructure. By 2030, Samsung aims to be not only a leader in memory, but also logic chips. Samsung notes that between now and 2030, the investments will come with increasing its workforce by some 15,000 jobs. And finally, Intel finally announced the rest of its Coffee Lake refresh lineup. If you've forgotten Coffee Lake, it's back, and it, it hasn't really gone away. This is alongside the H series of mobile chips, rounding out the long-awaited ninth generation family. Being another rewarmed iteration of Skylake, there are not too many notable new features or IPC increases or things like that to discuss, but the chips do bring higher frequencies within the same TDP profile. Intel adding Turbo Boost support to the entry-level i3 models is perhaps the most radical change, and one that is no doubt a response to AMD's Ryzen 3 models that are aggressively priced versus Intel's pricing for its own i3 models. The full 9th gen lineup offers the traditional non-K SKU variants of the high-end 9900K, the 9700K, and the 9600K, so you've got the non-K versions of those. Also, a uh, quick aside, 9th gen, not particularly fair naming, it's 9000 series, it's, it's 8th generation, which is kind of refreshes from before that, but uh, not really a new generation in itself. Additionally, Intel is debuting the not traditional KF and F suffix SKUs, which indicates chips with stripped IGPs. The lineup is punctuated by the new six core and eight core mobile parts, such as the 9980HK and the 9850H, which will be making their way into laptops soon. So uh, 9980HK might actually be pretty fun to work with. We'll, we'll try and get one. We might actually just buy a laptop with one of those if we can't get one, because that should be an overclocking part in a laptop and uh, hopefully is fun to work with. So even if it's not super practical, buy. So we'll try and get one. But that's it for the news for this week. Thank you for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to pick up one of these shirts or one of the mod mats, which are finally back in stock. Thank you for your patience. They're there now, though. And we'll see you all next time.